tonight is about how do they do that. A couple of years ago, I was on a training course. And on this training course, one of the things that I needed to do, or was required to do, was do some research and actually find a subject I wanted to know more about. And something I wanted to know more about was, how do people on the stage learn their part? How do they do that? We do. How do they do that? How do they hang on to all of that information? So I did some research and I looked into it. I'm going to focus entire, almost entirely on actors this evening, and in terms of that, I actually, one of the words I looked up today was thespian. So, is everyone familiar with that word, thespian? Thespian is a real problem if you don't want to spit at people sometimes when you use the word. But thespian is the word that actors often use in a kind of dramatic situation to talk about what they're doing. I looked up what that word meant just to make sure I was using it correctly. And it means somebody who comes from the city of Thessapia, or someone who is derived from the person, Thespis, who was in fact the first accredited actor. Ancient Greek, apparently. I would do the Texan if I knew it. Does anyone know Ancient Greek? <laughs> Show me. Uh, so what I did was I looked into, I, what I did is I interviewed some people. I found some people I knew did some of this kind of work. I had a friend who was into amateur dramatics. He was into musicals and he sang often on stage. Still, having done that, he was still my friend and I still went to see him. Sometimes a little unnerving. You know. uh, I also had someone, I was in connection with him, I contacted with someone who was a Shakespearean actor, had been a Shakespearean actor had worked at the National Theatre, had worked with some really big names. So that was someone else I was going to be able to talk to. And finally I decided to look at and study two of my favourite comedians. I was going to look at what, how they went about what they did and see if I could break that down. Two of my favourite comedians, Eddie Zard, Victoria Wood. And what I learned was four key things. First thing to do, read your part. Read it again, read it some more. Second thing you do, read it out loud. Do it again, do it some more. My Shakespearean actor friend also said, when he was learning his parts, he said, I would learn it visually. He said, because for me, you have to put a visual message, if you like, on the page, and if there were stains on the page, if there were annotations that someone else had done, if there was some underlining, he said, I would recall all of that. So that when I looked, when I was looking for my cue or looking for what was going to happen, I could see the whole page. For those of us who think or take pictures in our mind, that's probably very useful thing to do. So first was read it, read it. Second was read it out loud. Third was animate it. Animate what you're talking about. Animate your part. So that might be that what you want to do is sit down, stand up, Walk about, jazz hands, not jazz hands, whatever. Waving hands well, stepping backwards and forwards, moving around. Which takes us to the fourth thing, which was work your space. So you might want to make sure that you move around, that you do lots of pacing, that you move up and down, that you come over here. If you're on stage, you might want to be where the lighting is. You want to understand what happens with the lighting. You might want to be able to visualise something different from over here. So mapping that. The two comedians, or, uh, comedians that, uh, that I looked at, Eddie Izzard. Everybody know Eddie Izzard? Yeah. yeah. So Eddie Izzard, is, uh, he uses the stage. And you can watch him using the stage, and he uses it as a way to remember what he's doing. So he'll come off over here, and he'll start going, ah! and start talking about what he talked about. Have, have um, cake or death. Has anyone heard of him do that? Cake or death. Some of you do that, do you? What cake or death? Cake, please. Cake or death. Uh, cake, please. Cake or death. Death. <gasps> no, I meant cake. <laughs> so he would move around the stage, and you could see him anchor to a spot and knew what he was talking about. Victoria Wood was very opposite to that. So what she would do, the sad mess that she is, she would actually use props to be in a good place. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to need some water. Can I? 
not because I'm going to throw it at people, just because I'm going to throw it <laughs> Thank you. So Victoria would use this cross and she gets into a particular space. <coughs> Everybody know Victoria Wood? Yeah. Would you like to hear a bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a particular thing she used to do where she would stand in the middle of the stage and she used very small gestures and she would be here wearing a hat and a long coat and would go, have you seen her? Have you seen her? My mate Kimberly. She's really, really tall and really, really wide. We're celebrating. We're celebrating. She's lost a pound. But wait, she's, I'm celebrating catching my boots. And she would then move on and she'd do something else and she'd take a coat off and she'd sit at the piano and the piano would be the thing that made her carry on and go on to her next stage. So what I learned from this particular piece, as I said, is how do they do that? The way that they do that are those four key things. They read their part. They read it some more. They read it out loud. They animate it. They make sure what they do is they take it on board. They move around. They make that sort of stuff happen. And then they map their stage. They go to a particular part. They go to this particular area. And they know that's what they're going to do. So that's how they do that. Do you know what, that's really interesting about the animating the visual is because, you know, that, someone must know the story of the Gruffalo. Yeah. I read that literally about ten times a week, but if I'm stood here, I could not tell you the start of the Gruffalo. But if I do the actions, I can tell you the start of it. It must be some sort of link. Stood here, I can't think of the first line, but if I start walking around, a mouse took a stroll in the deep dark wood, a mouse saw a fox in the fox in the wood. I can't say it's starting still, it's really Anyway, so we're going to do this thing where you get in groups, just like people in the t on your table, the table behind you, and talk about Sue behind her back for a few minutes, <laughs> and then write anonymously on a bit of paper behind her back. <laughs> so two minutes, please. Right, time's up. Exactly. Okay. 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 Okay.
So we just time normal. Yeah. Time normal. You mean like the time normal time? Yeah, come to come So I just uh, actually I'll just tell you something funny before we move on. I was sat on that table once, um, doing this group talking. That table in the top right corner, and we were talking about the speech. It was all fairly constructive stuff. Not realising that camera was directly behind us filming. <laughs> so whoever's been talking on that table just. Well, be <laughs> right, speech number two. Speech number two is from Janine. And evaluating Janine is Lizeth. So, Lizeth, if you could just tell us about the speech, please. I was going to do the evaluation. Two minutes for to do the evaluation for the first. Which is what I'm going to show. Um, no, if, if you come up, is that what we're doing, Tony? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you come up and tell us about Janine's yeah. speech, yeah. Hi everyone, so today we're going to have the full Jenny Janine uh, giving us a speech at this is project to persuade me power. So things I'll be looking out um, for will be uh, or she will things I will be evaluating the uh, can I just say again? <laughs> things I will be evaluating will be her kind of translation on on our song on the public. Um, also analyze that she's um, analyzed the audience um, and chosen a topic that will be interesting for everyone. So she will try to persuade us to adopt a viewpoint or ideas or to take some kind of action. So I'll be um, evaluating those factors. So please welcome Jenny. Masters and honoured guests. I think there's a bit of sod law here, as you will see as I continue. Now, this club, All Mark Speakers, is a good club. It's a very good club. We had a visit just the other month from our future area director, and she gave us the most marvellous report. We had excellent speeches. We have a lovely venue, we're well organised, and we're meeting our targets as a club. We are a really good club. But I think there's something missing. How many people here today have been in Toastmasters at least three years? This is where Sod's Law works. There are five of them, I think, or maybe six. Now, a third of the members of this club have been in the club more than three years. That's 13 people. And usually, there's only three or four of them here. And my question is, where have all the members gone? Why aren't they here? And does it matter? Well, I think it does matter for a number of reasons. You see, these members have experience. And as you have noticed if you were here last time, Dee immediately got landed with the Toastmaster because she's experienced. And what has happened today? Greg has come and he's doing the Toastmaster's role at the last minute because he's experienced. So we learn from their experiences. And there's another reason why it matters. That's because, as a third of our membership, if they drop out, we're in trouble financially as a club. We need their money, but we also need their presence. And that made me think, what are we going to do to encourage these members to come more regularly? Some are away. Now, Peter here has been abroad. We can't really hold that against him, can we? He, when he goes to family, he can't come. But others must be deciding on a Wednesday night, like Greg explained, am I going to go to Toastmasters tonight? No. And is that because of something we do here that is causing them to hesitate? Is it not as interesting as it used to be? Let me give you just one idea that I think may be affecting people's reason for not coming. And I think it's the speeches. Hey, wait a minute, you will say to me, you've just said the speeches are really good. 
and the speeches are really good. Technically, the speeches here are really good. So what's wrong with the speeches? First of all, I'm going to talk about icebreakers. Everybody, if they're starting on the competent communication manual, have to do an icebreaker. And you'd be surprised how many members have said to me, I love the icebreakers. We used to have one nearly every week. But now we have the Accelerated Speakers Workshop. They're all, almost all, in the workshop and not at our meetings. When the workshop was set up, we thought people have to do their icebreaker first, then they can go to ASW. But it, it's impractical. People join the club, they want to get a move on. So they go to the workshop, they do their icebreaker, and we don't actually hear them until another later speech. Now what's the icebreaker for? It's for two things. First of all, it's to give you a chance to just get off the ground, to get started. It's to get rid of those, some of those nerves. The nerves may go on a bit longer than that, but it's a start, you're on the way. But it's also to introduce you to the club. Now I'm not saying that you all have to do your icebreaker here, but please, new members, can we have a biographical talk telling us something about your life? We want to know you. Now I'm the treasurer, I get the bank statement. There are people who are paying £13 a month. I don't know who they are. And if I don't know, and I'm here every week, every meeting, what about you? Do you know everybody? Let's have some more introductions to you, please. The other thing, and you may not agree with me, but I actually am a bit fed up with what I might call motivational speeches, improvement speeches, speeches that encourage me to do better, to do differently. And the individual speeches, they're great. But there's been a whole lot of them recently. And I'm just asking, can we have some variety? Rather than telling me how to be focused or happy or to get my resolutions right or whatever. How about the other things that are in the manual? If you look under speech number two, there are four suggestions of things you might do. One is you can um, manual. Where is it? Uh, the first thing it suggests is that you use discussions you've had with people, like my um, my one on uh, grammar schools was as a result of a family discussion that got very heated. You could also use life experiences. Life's full of interesting things. On the time when we were asked to talk about holidays in the warm-up, you couldn't stop people. Well, most people here travel. What if, or what about the, all the people? Most of the people in this room, I reckon, were brought up abroad. You came to this country. There are so many stories you could tell us about, I'm sure. Another thing is expertise. I think Phil is an absolute wonder. Could anyone but Phil make us excited, fascinated by car engines? But he can. <laughs> he loves them. He's an expert. And you all have expertise in something. Let's hear about it. Let's hear your hobbies, your interests. And uh, the last one, I'm afraid I just can't remember. I know what it is. It's collecting things like articles you read or um, something that specially interests you. And I was just touched before about the talk you'd had on, or learning you'd done on the Mayflower in Southampton. Fascin it would make a fascinating talk. So I'm saying to you, Toastmasters, take the challenge. We want to get these members to come back, and as I said, there's a lot of them here today, they usually aren't. You can ask them if this is right. If it is, how about varying your speeches next time? Where have all the members gone? Well,
let's see if we can get them back again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janine. I'm going to tell you another very quick story before we do the evaluation. My wife was a bad Toastmaster. In the early days of our marriage, when she did things to make me happy and stuff, she used to come with Toastmasters to humour me, basically. And she came for three years. And in those three years, I think she came to 25 meetings. And in those 25 meetings, she did a grand total of zero speeches. So that is £300 I'm never going to get back. Can have a refund? Anyway, two minutes, groups, talk about Janine. <laughs> This was the speech of persuade. Yeah. She was trying to persuade us that she was trying to achieve us. Nobody seems to say something like Does it say it there? She persuades. So did she persuade you? So did I hear it? Don't be telling Okay. I'll do it. I think this speech was special. Uh, it was special. It is exactly what you want to I mean, you're And we are now on the final speech. This is a speech by Doug, and it's going to, oh my God, it's going to be reviewed or evaluated by Tony, the man himself. <laughs> so, Tony, if you could just tell us about Doug's speech and what you're looking for, please. Okay. Thank you.
Yeah. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters and guests. I want to introduce you to a guy that I have known not quite long ago, recently. And just like you said before the meeting started, when he was introduced here to talk about the conference they went for, this is someone who has inspired me a lot. A lot that he, when he came here, he knew exactly what he wants. And he's getting there. And today, what is his objective? He's talking about speech number seven. You are ability to get from one to five is a great task. But to get from six to seven to ten, that is a wonderful one. And today, he's Responsibility which project is about researching this topic. Just like we heard from the last speaker, is to actually talk about something you do or something you have interest in or something outside the, I mean, the ordinary, just like a car engine. So today, I don't know what this topic is going to be about, but it's going to do an outright research in that topic and to give us an educational view of it. I don't know what role is going to go into entertaining, education, educating us, or maybe inspiring us. But however, it's supposed to give us content that has to do with research, proper work, thorough work on it. It's going to give us insights of what this topic is about. And it's going to do this for about five to seven minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing you to the poet of Hallmark Speakers <laughs> Mr. Edwarda. Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! Hail! Hail Caesar! Hail! Just the ladies! Hail Caesar! Hail! Just the guys! Hail Caesar! Everyone at once! Hail Caesar! Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters, most welcome guests, thank you for joining me in the warm up. There will be audience participation in the speech. <laughs> Tonight, we're going to have a history lesson with a different we are going to try and bring history to life. We are going to experience what it was like to be in a battle in the ancient world. The date, 48 BC. The place, Pharsalus in Greece. The stakes, the entire Roman world. This was the greatest battle in Julius Caesar's career. He led his army, Caesar's legion, against the only other force in the world capable of standing against him, another Roman legion. He was fighting his rival, once his friend, Pompey the Great. And this was going to decide who controlled Rome. Was it going to be Pompey's faction, the Senate, the old guard, the wealthy patricians? Or was it going to be Caesar and his popular people's uprising? Caesar had command of 22,000 Roman soldiers. Pompey had command of 45,000 Roman soldiers. Caesar was outnumbered two to one. But Caesar was always outnumbered, and it had never bothered him before. Now, I don't know how much you know about ancient warfare, but there are two important factors to have a good army. You need discipline, and you need ferocity. Now, the ferocity of the Roman legions let them be, as was their discipline. They always stayed in their formations, they fought in their ranks, they knew how to keep a cool head in battle. But you also had to be able to get worked up, to get angry. And this was part of Pompey's plan, you see. It's not easy to take a human life. It's not something that most people are capable of. One general marshal discovered in his researches during the Second World War that on average only about 30% of soldiers discharged their weapons with kid intent. The remaining 70% would either not fire their guns, or they would fire them and deliberately miss. They didn't have that killer instinct. We needed that in the battle. So this is what medieval and ancient fighters would do. They would have a charge. They would work their soldiers up into a battle frenzy, get them ready to fight, get them ready to kill. This was necessary. But Pompey had a plan, because his soldiers were all recruits. They were young and experienced, but they were also quite sprightly. Whereas Julius Caesar's soldiers were a little bit, a little bit grey in the beard, a little bit long in the tooth. So Pompey wasn't going to charge. His men were going to hold their ground and stay put. And Caesar's legion would have to charge double the normal distance. They would be tired, they would be worn out. And this would be the advantage that he needed in order to win the battle. So now it's time for the audience participation, ladies and gentlemen. 
you are going to be Caesar's legion. I will be your centurion. <laughs> Please get involved. Use your hands as your swords, your tables as your shields to keep the beat. And when the moment comes, be ready with your battle cry of charge. Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! Friends, Romans, countrymen, this is the final battle for the fate of Rome. Finally, we will defeat the patricians that have hoarded the wealth of Rome for so long. We will reclaim Rome in the name of Caesar, in the name of the people. Hail Caesar! Hail, Hail Caesar! Caesar! Working on all that anger. This was the control that Caesar had over his legions. Now, put yourself in the sandals of Pompey's men. You're a young Roman recruit, you're inexperienced. You've just faced down a charge by the most terrifying military force in the entire world. But you've been holding on to this thin thread of hope. These men are going to be tired, they're going to be exhausted when they get to you. That's going to be your edge. It's going to be the edge you need. And then they do the impossible. They stop in the middle of a charge. It can't be done. These men aren't human. And then they stand there looking at you. Maybe, maybe even giving you a cheeky smile and a wink. Oh, almost got us there, Pompey. Very clever. <laughs> but we're not going to fall for it. And then you see every breath they take, that tiny advantage, the little advantage you had, slips away like sand through your fingers. And then... Begin again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I need to tell you which science we taught us that day. I think you understand. Because there's more to history than facts and figures and dates. The best way to learn history is to live history. Thank you for helping me bring history to life this evening. <laughs> I suggest when we all get into work tomorrow in our office, I'm close to my Get up from the table, give it some of that. Yes. I'm not sure we're we'll going to go over well, but I'm going to give it a go. Right, that is the end of all our speeches, I believe. So, two minutes to talk about Doug.